Okay, so let me continue from what I, I was uh, doing in the previous uh, lecture. I was in this, uh, this talk discussing about chiral superfields. And a chiral superfield, as I say, was a, a, a superfield such that it is the d bar acting on phi equal to zero. And uh, <coughs> working in the components by writing the, the y mu equals to x mu <coughs> plus i theta sigma theta bar, we were able to prove that, uh, that d bar alpha dot of phi of y theta and theta bar equal to zero. And that means that then phi was only a function of y and theta, but not theta dot. <coughs> and, uh, and because of that, we were able to write the general expression for phi in a very simple way, which was uh, phi equals to phi plus uh, <coughs> root 2 theta psi plus y plus theta theta f. And I told you that, uh, so, so and we stop here because there's only one theta. There's no theta bars. So, so, uh, so, so the expansion of phi it stops at the, at the two thetas instead of the general superfield that was stopping at the two thetas plus two theta bars. And uh, so this will describe a standard uh, scalar field, this is a standard fermion field, and this will be something that uh, we call an auxiliary field. And we will see why in the next uh, lecture. <coughs> OK. But uh, this using coordinates y, in general, we have to go back and write the same superfield in terms of the coordinates x. And for that, we will, it will have more components, but they will, they will not be independent. The only independent components we know are phi, psi, and f. But uh, for completeness, in terms of x, this person is a bit longer, and uh, so that will be phi of x plus psi of x plus theta theta f of x. So that's so far is the same. And then, but the rest we have to, we can write, we have to write x as y minus i theta theta bar and i theta sigma mu theta bar and then expand. And so that's why we, we will get extra terms with the um, more powers of thetas. And uh, so that will be plus i theta sigma mu theta bar d mu phi minus i over root 2 theta theta d mu psi sigma mu theta bar minus 1 quarter theta 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 bar theta bar box phi. <coughs> OK, so you can see these are the same independent components, phi, psi, and f. And all the extra terms that we have, they are just different functions of phi, psi, and actually f doesn't appear any longer. <coughs> OK, so now we have this general chiral superfield. And uh, we can apply on the, to it a standard supersymmetry transformation. So we, have, we can apply a Suzy transformation. Which we know is uh, delta phi equals i epsilon q plus epsilon bar q 
bar. Okay, where Q and Q bar were the differential operators that I was uh, uh, describing to you uh, previously. So now we can <coughs> de take delta phi will be all this acting on phi, of course. And uh, if you do that, then you can do it component by component and read up what, how each component transforms. And, and then that, the transformations is, are relatively simple. So this, this implies that the, each of the components transforms as follows. Delta phi is root 2 epsilon psi. Delta psi equals i root 2 sigma mu epsilon bar d mu phi plus root 2 epsilon f and delta f equals root 2 i epsilon bar sigma bar mu d mu Psi. Okay, and that's an exercise. That's something you'll have to do in the next example sheet. It's just very straightforward. Just use the expression we know for the differential operators Q and Q bar, plug it into the general expression for the phi, and then compare component by component, and you will read how the scalar transforms, the fermion transform, and the auxiliary field transforms. Okay. <coughs> okay. What can we learn about this? Well, as a standard thing, the scalar is transforming into a fermion, as uh, we know under supersymmetry. A fermion goes to the scalar and the other, and the other scalar. And of course, f goes to psi. So supersymmetry is doing what uh, we are expected to do. <coughs> the other observation we can make is that, uh, again, notice that Delta F, F being the auxiliary field, is equal to all that, but all that, what it is, is just a total derivative. And that will be uh, very important for us when we construct uh, Lagrangians. So remember that when I introduced to you the general scalar superfield, the last component, uh, the, the D, that transforms as a total derivative also. So now the same thing happens here. The last component, F, transforms as a total derivative. And keep that in mind for, for uh, when we discuss the effective Lagrangians. OK. So this is the first remark. Second. As it happened with, uh, with the scalar superfields, and uh, 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 it's relatively easy to see, is that if you have a product of chiral superfields, it's a chiral superfield. This is uh, straightforward. You know the product of two superfields is a superfield, but the chiral, the chiral property means that is the d bar acting on that is zero. It's true for for uh, for a product because we're essentially d is a differential operator, so we can use uh, the the product rule. And if phi one and phi two are annihilated by d bar, then the product of them is also annihilated by d bar. <coughs> so, and in general, any function of a chiral superfield will be chiral. But this function has to be a function of phi, not of phi bar. <coughs> so that, in general, which we will call a holomorphic, using the same notation as in complex variables, F of 
phi is, is, is also chiral superfield. Okay. The important thing here is that f depends on phi and not on phi bar. Okay, that's, that's why it's, that's why it's, that is why the term holomorphic is in. As, as we, you remember in, in complex variables, a function of z but not of z bar was called uh, holomorphic. And so it is the same thing here. So as long as it depends only on phi but not on phi bar or phi dagger, then this, any function of a chiral superfield remains chiral. And again, this is very important for constructing Lagrangians. <coughs> The remark is that if phi is chiral, then as expected, <coughs> phi bar or phi dagger is anti chiral. Remember the anti chiral fields were the ones annihilated by d, not by d bar. <coughs> so if you have a chiral field, we, we know that we can build an anti-chiral field by just taking the complex conjugation. So there's nothing, nothing, nothing especially new about anti-chiral fields. And just to be products like this, Of, or combinations like that. This is superfield, this is chiral, this is anti chiral, this is chiral, this is anti chiral. They are superfields, but they are not, they don't have any particular chirality. In this case, real, this is phi phi dagger and phi plus phi dagger, but not chiral, as expected, because it's a combination of chiral and anti-chiral. <coughs> OK. So, <coughs> so those are the, the properties of uh, chiral superfields. And uh, before trying to construct Lagrangians for them, I will move on now to describe vector superfields. And once I have the whole picture with the chiral and vector superfields, then we can start building Lagrangians that couple both kinds of, both kinds of uh, superfields. Okay. Any questions so far? Good. So let me move now then to vector superfields. And as I told you, the definition of a vector superfield is just start with a general, what we call the scalar superfield, the S, but impose a V of x theta and theta bar equals to V dagger. So that means that it's a real superfield. <coughs> okay. So, Having the, uh, this condition, then we can take the general uh, scalar superfield that I wrote for you a couple of lectures ago, and then just impose that uh, some of the components will be identified with each other, or some of them will be real because of this condition. So that will reduce the number of components of the superfield. <coughs> so unfortunately, well, I have to write a long expression for the general uh, vector superfield. So it will take me a couple of minutes, and it's a nice exercise for your hand. So, <clears throat> so then I call the scalar component, I call it C, just to make it special for the scalar component of a vector superfield. And in this case, this will be real because of the reality condition. Contrary to the chiral superfield, where the first component was a complex scalar. 
plus i theta chi minus i theta bar chi bar plus i over 2 theta theta n plus i n minus i over 2 theta bar theta bar n minus i n plus theta sigma mu theta bar v mu <coughs> plus i theta 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 bar lambda bar of x plus i over 2 sigma bar mu d mu chi of x minus i theta bar theta bar theta lambda of x plus i over 2 sigma mu d mu chi bar of x I will confirm you later about this sign. Uh, I, I will think about it. Plus one half theta 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 bar theta bar d minus one half box c. <coughs> so the important thing about uh, this superfluid is that it has components. The bosonic ones are C, M, and N. The three are uh, real. Then you have uh, the V mu and D. Okay, so we have one, two, three, four, plus four, these are eight bosonic components. And then you will have um, chi and lambda, each of them having, since so you have a chi alpha and lambda alpha, each of them having two, two times two, so it's a four plus four. Okay, because they are complex. And so then we can see that there are as many bosons as fermions in the superfield. <coughs> Okay. Okay, so it's eight bosonic and eight fermionic. Okay. And the field is called a vector superfield because it has the V mu as one of the components. So it's, it, it is the superfield that includes a vector field on, on it. And, uh, and this is uh, the relevant part. Yes? But if you call it a vector superfield, 
How would you call a uh, new S, for example? Yes, a superfield that is vectorial in nature. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, so, okay. sometimes people just call this a real superfield, but uh, it's a scalar. As a superfield, it's a scalar, yes, but uh, yes, but uh, it, it it is called vector because of that because it, it has the the vector. Uh, feel inside the superfield, that, and and that's those will be the relevant ones, the cattle and the vector superfield. So that's 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 what what uh, it is usually not uh, ambiguous because we never talk about the other one. You know. yeah. But it's a good point. Okay, we can no, we can notice the following. We can notice that. <coughs> If lambda, capital lambda, is a chiral superfield, <coughs> then I lambda minus lambda dagger, this combination is uh, real, because you take the dagger of this, you change the sign, gives you the same thing. That means that this is a vector superfield. That this is OK, so a simple way of building a vector superfield is taking a lambda superfield and take a, a, a real combination of it. It's either this or just lambda plus lambda dagger. You would have liked. But usually it's convenient to, to write it in this way. So this is a vector superfield, and then we can see the components and co compare. We know the general component for uh, lambda, and now we know the general components of V, and we can compare how the, they are uh, related. And, uh, and so this uh, I lambda minus lambda dagger has components which are the C is equal to I phi minus phi uh, dagger. Chi is root 2 psi. And the uh, n plus I n is F. V mu, important. V mu is minus D mu. Phi plus phi dagger. Lambda equals to d equal to zero. Okay. By the way, if uh, probably you may have noticed that uh, there is this extra term here on d, uh, I added this box c, that was not present in the general superfield. We are free to add something very scalar. It's just like a redefinition of d is of d. And it is convenient to add it because then that will tell us that uh, that uh, remember that the if I wrote it here <coughs> if I wrote it uh, I erase it remember oh yes I have it there look at that the last term of the of the chiral superfield is a theta 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 bar theta bar box phi and uh, so because of that you can essentially cancel the box C, and then that gives us that D equal to zero. So that's a convenient thing. It's nothing, nothing deep, just, just to keep track of what we are doing. OK, so, <coughs> so this is important. So out of this combination of chiral superfields, we made a vector superfield for which the components take these values. So now we can use this as a way to define a transformation on vector superfields. And a transformation will, which will generalize the standard gauge transformation. Remember that a, a, a vector field uh, under a gauge transformation, it transforms like v mu goes to v mu plus d mu of alpha or something. OK, remember that? How a vector transforms under a gauge transformation? Yes? You, you know that. Eh? Or you haven't seen it yet? You know, yes. You know. And so we will do a generalization right now, a generalization of that very important fact of gauge transformations to 
a, to a super field, to a vector super field. So, this will be only a formal discussion because there is no symmetry yet, but in principle, we can then generalize a gauge transformation and that was one of the things introduced by Wes and Zumino as many of the things in, in this subject. And <clears throat> that is that you start, you take a, a superfield, vector superfield V, and then that goes to V plus I lambda minus lambda dagger. Okay. <clears throat> so this is a, a generalized, generalized gauge transformation. Just take a vector superfield and shift it by this combination. We know already that this is a, 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 a vector superfield, so the combination is vector superfield, but this is a particular one defined by, by those uh, parameters. So, so that means that, <coughs> in particular, now you can see the, the vector component of this superfield, v mu, what will do? It will go to v mu plus the vector component of this superfield, which is d mu phi plus phi dagger. So this is precisely a gauge transformation in vector, uh, for vector fields, okay? So that's, that's the nice thing. So that the, this transformation generalizes the idea of a gauge transformation. So this induces a standard Gauge transformation for the vector component of V in the sense that in the sense that the uh, delta oh sorry uh, V mu goes to V mu minus d mu of phi plus phi dagger, and this is what we will just be calling alpha a real parameter of the transformation. So in general, instead of dealing with just an alpha, which is a gauge uh, uh, parameter, we are dealing now with the full superfield lambda minus lambda dagger. <coughs> Okay, and this is important because then now, since we have a gauge transformation, we can make a, a we, can f we can fix a gauge. We can choose a particular transformation that make our our field simpler, and that's what is what we will do now. I insist that all of this is formal because usually when you talk about transformations, are transformations that leave something invariant. Here, since we don't have any action yet, we, we don't know what is this, what is invariant under this, but we will see that next. But in the problem, just, just defining this as, as a formal transformation that generalizes the standard gauge transformation. So that, that's the only thing I'm doing. <coughs> so, so now, then, we can choose the components phi, psi, and f within lambda, because lambda is a, is a transformation parameter, to gauge away some of the components of, of, of v. Of 
on the fold vector superfield. Okay. Okay, <clears throat> and this is what is usually called the West Zubino gauge. <clears throat> In the sense that we can choose the, for instance, we can choose Phi and phi, uh, phi such that phi minus phi dagger cancel the C component of V. So there is, then there will not be C component of V. So that's a choice already. We can choose the same thing with Psi uh, to cancel uh, chi and so on. So then in the West Umino gauge, we can write now the vector superfield that I have written for you over there. It takes the following form. It will be theta sigma mu theta bar v mu of x, of course, plus i theta 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 bar lambda bar of x minus i theta bar theta bar theta lambda of x plus one half theta 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 bar theta bar d of x. Okay. Let me let me just try to tell you what I I did. I started with all a, a standard uh, vector superfield with all these components c n n v mu and d. Now I'm shifting that by this lambda minus lambda dagger that has these components. So then I choose this one to cancel the C component of phi. So then C will be zero. I choose this one to cancel the chi component of, of, of V, and so the chi is zero. And then the same thing for, for F, for M and N. And uh, of course, I cannot cancel the D component because uh, this one is, is I cannot cancel lambda nor d because the, the lambda and d of this uh, vector superfield are zero, so they, you cannot adjust them to cancel anything. So that means that this, this tells you clearly what the, the real uh, degrees of freedom of this uh, vector superfield are, and you can see that now the prominence of, of, of the vector component because is now the first component of the vector superfield. And in this one is when you will have all the gauge particles. <clears throat> Gauge particles, so the photon, the Ws, and the Z, and the gluon. The lambda, or well, the, in general, the uh, lambda or uh, uh, lambda bar, that will give you the gejinos, which are, again, the Fotino and so on. And D, again, as in the case of the vector of the chiral superfield, you have an extra component, and this is a, is a, is a auxiliary. It's an auxiliary field. <clears throat> okay. Okay. So this is this is a, a simple expression for for the vector superfield in the West Zumino gauge, and then <clears throat> you can simplify things from V with this expression. Notice that if we want to compute powers of, of this vector superfield, say for instance, V 
Weso minus square, since already the beginning has two thetas, one theta and one theta bar, when you square this, this tell us this will give us two thetas and two theta bars, but this one will give already too many thetas that will give you zero. And the same thing for the other ones. So then the square of this is only I have theta theta bar v mu v mu <coughs> and uh, as I say so it's only the square of this and then you use properties of the of, of, of the sigmas to reduce this two products to this uh, theta theta bars theta bars and, uh, and nothing else so you don't have any other term in the square so this is very simple and of course v to the power n greater than 2 in the west amino gauge is 0. Because now you start taking a uh, multiplying this times v, you have saturated the maximum number of thetas, so you cannot go beyond that. OK? <coughs> so <coughs> so this, is the, this is the nice thing about using this west amino gauge. So, however, we have to have a, a warning, and the warning is that that the West amino gauge actually does not commute with supersymmetry. So it's something we have to keep in mind whenever we, we work with it. West amino gauge is not supersymmetric. <coughs> that means that if I take on the supersymmetry, if I take V on the West amino gauge and make a supersymmetry transformation. That will give you another V, but not on the West amino gauge. Okay, that's that's something. However, <coughs> under a combination of SUSI and generalized gauge transformation, We can always do the following. We can start V with Zumino, make a SUSI transformation, get to the V prime, not in the West Zumino gauge, but then do another generalized gauge transformation. And then that will give you another V on the West Amino gauge. So we can always use the two properties to bring you back to the West Amino gauge. So that, that is something that is useful. So and it still keeps the West Amino gauge as, as, a, as, a, as an important tool when we will build Lagrangians for vector superfields. <coughs> now, I told you that, that uh, uh, this gauge transformation generalizes the, the, the standard gauge transformation. Uh, but uh, the gauge transformation, the standard gauge transformation, we know how, how a vector field transforms under a gauge transformation, and we also know how a matter field, like a, a scalar field or so, or fermion 
transforms under a, a gauge transformation. And just by say, if the gauge transformation is a U1, the corresponding field transforms as a phase. So let's try to see how this will be in the case of supersymmetry. So, <coughs> transformation of a chiral superfield. Okay, so we know in the pre-supersymmetry era <laughs> that uh, a standard complex field will transform like e to the i alpha. And let's put a q here, just to see that it can, it can have a charge. <coughs> times phi. <coughs> okay. Where this is a U1 transformation where alpha is parameter of the U1 and Q charge. Typically we can take charge equal to one, but it would be minus one or something else. So let's let's keep it general. And, <clears throat> and of course, under this, a vector will go to V mu plus D mu alpha. And alpha in general, can be a function of of x. If this is a gauge transformation, there will be a local transformation. <coughs> okay, that's in the old days when people didn't know enough. <coughs> now, in our lifetime with supersymmetry, so what is it that we we, we will try to generalize? this uh, expression, so we know that uh, the transformation is V goes to V plus, uh, I wrote it for you, it's uh, I lambda minus lambda dagger. And uh, <coughs> then what I will propose is the following, is phi goes to e to the i q lambda times phi. It's a standard generalization. If, if, if now lambda is taking the role of, the, of alpha, so we expect that the whole superfield transforms like a phase with this as parameter times phi. You will have written just a simple number here it may not be very good because we, st we want to keep the property that phi is chiral. If this is just a e to the i q alpha of x, then this object will not be a chiral superfield. But if, since lambda is a chiral superfield and phi is chiral, this product is also a chiral superfield. Okay, so that, that is a well defined transformation. Yes? But it's not only phase anymore. Yes. Yes, exactly. So it's a more complicated same thing because we, ha we have lambda as a full superfield. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so this is uh, the, the the standard generalization. Notice this is also chiral. Okay. And the last thing I have to do for you, if you give me two more minutes, is. Uh, <coughs> to define the field strength superfield. <laughs> the 
the field strength superfield that will generalize the F nu nu that we know we define F nu nu to be d nu v nu minus d nu v nu. If it is a, a billion, if it is not a billion, we know that it has an extra, an extra piece. So, <coughs> in particular, for the abelian case, V transforms, V transforms, but then, because of this uh, difference of derivatives, F happens to be invariant under, under the, the gauge transformation. In the supersymmetry case, we will define a new object, and this new object I call uh, w, w, but with an index alpha. And w with an index alpha, we will define it as, uh, well, for conventions, there's a minus one quarter here. There's a d bar square, and then there's a d alpha of v. So where, again, the d's are the covariant derivatives that I defined in the previous lecture. So this will be the, the, the new object that has some properties. First of all, <coughs> W is chiral. You can see easily, but, but it's, it's, that means that d bar alpha dot W alpha is zero. Second, notice that this is the first super field that we are using that carries an index, index itself. That's uh, different from, from uh, other, the other ones that were just particular cases of the scalar super field. But it's, it's still, it's annihilated by d bar, so it's called a chiral super field. It's also invariant. Under a generalized transformation. And the last thing I want to tell you is that the reason we define this W then this way is when you write W in components, in the same way that we have been writing all the other superfields in components, in components, W alpha, and then I will use the coordinate <coughs> y, as, as I use in the, in the catalyst of the field case. And this happened to be minus i lambda alpha y plus theta alpha dy minus i over 2 sigma mu sigma bar nu, theta, alpha, f mu nu, plus theta, theta, sigma mu, okay. So notice that this superfield doesn't have any new components. Lambda, d, and the v that is inside this f, because f is d mu v nu minus d nu v nu. So <coughs> uh, they are all components already inside v. But the interesting thing about w is that one of its components is precisely the f mu field. And that's the relevant thing. That, 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 that's what is called the field strength superfield, because it includes the field strength here. And that, again, will be important when we build up Lagrangians, because remember that Lagrangians for electromagnetism includes the F mu, not the A mu explicitly. So then you will, we will build Lagrangians in terms of this object, W alpha. OK, so I think I took enough of your time, and uh, I will continue next time. <laughs>